So next up, we have uh, Dr. Amrit Lotta, who is a consultant cardiologist in cardiac MRI and inflammatory heart muscle disease uh, at the Brompton and Harefield Hospitals. Um, and Amrit has a lot of experience in, in the inflammatory heart muscle world. And I'm sure his talk is going to be uh, really enlightening for us all. So Amrit, it's a pleasure to invite you to the stage. Uh, lovely to see you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the uh, invitation to be here this afternoon. So I'm going to talk about uh, myocarditis, inherited cardiomyopathy, and I'm going to focus my talk on the role of genetics. So myocarditis refers to inflammation of the heart muscle. Uh, in response to any injury anywhere in the body, you can have a fairly characteristic sequence of events, ultimately leading in heat, pain, redness and swelling as depicted here. We know about this and this does occur within the myocardium in response to a myocarditis. Um, we know that myocarditis can be due to many different causes. Uh, acute viruses tend to be the main etiology. Equally drugs, toxins and various autoimmune diseases are also implicated. And our understanding over recent years has evolved. We do now know that COVID-19 has also been added to the list of viruses that can cause an acute myocarditis. And most patients will present with acute chest pain. And uh, these presentations tend to account for about 80 to 95 percent, followed by heart failure or arrhythmic syndromes. Clinical outcomes are highly variable. We know um, that many patients will show a spontaneous recovery in up to two thirds of patients, uh, but that is very variable, as we'll see. Now, myocarditis affects around 22 cases per 100,000 of the world's population based on data from around 2013. Um, however, we also know that myocarditis accounts for around half of all presentations to hospital with chest pain, troponin elevation, but unobstructed coronary arteries. We also know that myocarditis is the fourth most common cause of a sudden cardiac death, found in up to 12% of post-mortem studies. And it's also lurking in the background in around 9% of idiopathic DCM cases, potentially even more. So all of those things led us to look at this in a bit more detail. So part of the research I've been involved in is to look at the epidemiology of myocarditis using data available within the NHS. So over the last 70 years, uh, we've been collecting data perhaps for the last 20, and we've been able to look at the number of admissions due to myocarditis um, across the country. So the figure here is just showing the number of admissions due to acute myocarditis, uh, which is the red line. Um, as you can see, the number of admissions per year is rapidly increasing up to around 2000 per year uh, in the most recent annualized uh, set of data. And that's compared to the background number of admissions due to any cardiological uh, diagnosis shown by the blue line in the background. Obviously, the scale is very different. This is referring to all of cardiology, and you can see the rate of increases is, is not as steep as what we're seeing with myocarditis. And that's something we can talk about later. There are lots of different reasons for that. Now, in terms of um, outcomes after myocarditis, it's highly variable. We all like to see patients recover with normal LV function, with no evidence of fibrosis on their MRI scan. These patients have completely healed. And we know their clinical outcome is virtually identical to a healthy patient. Um, there's no difference. Some patients drop their LV function very transiently, then they recover, or they may be left with a small region of fibrosis uh, somewhere on, uh, on the myocardium. So in a study that we did a few years ago in 2021, we recruited a cohort of 400 patients with uh, non-ischemic fibrosis in the setting of normal left ventricular volumes and ejection fraction. So these essentially are patients where in many cases will have incidental finding of uh, myocardial fibrosis. And what we showed was that there was no difference in all cause mortality amongst the patients with myocarditis or previous myocarditis compared to healthy controls, which is reassuring for, for many of our patients where even there may be an incidental finding on the CMR scan of some fibrosis, but with normal LV size and function. The big question is what's going on in these patients where they have a drop in their LV function that may continue to crash leading to a fulminant presentation, or it may just stay suppressed over the longer term in what we call an inflammatory cardiomyopathy. The key question is what makes these individuals different? Is there an underlying genetic 
predisposition behind some of this. Now, if we take a step back, um, most of us will catch various you know, viral infections over our lifetime, but only a subset will get myocarditis. And of the ones that get myocarditis, only a subset go on to have these fulminant presentations with DCM or arrhythmia. They clearly is going to be an underlying genetic background somewhere in that midst. And so as part of my research, we've tried to understand and we hypothesize, could it be that the patients that develop LV dysfunction carry underlying genetic variants linked with cardiomyopathy associated genes? The background to this is that there's been a lot of interest in titan. Titan is a gene that encodes a, a protein called titan, which is a, a huge protein within the sarcomeric unit responsible for contraction, also signaling and lots of other things. There's been lots of research recently within our group to understand how healthy individuals who harbor an underlying truncating variant in titan, when exposed to a particular environmental modifier, then go on to present with DCM. So patients, female patients who become pregnant, harboring an underlying titan truncating variant, that cardiovascular load can then lead to them having LB dysfunction. Likewise, it explains why some patients can drink to excess and be fine, whereas others go on to develop LB dysfunction. And equally, those with various forms of chemotherapy, uh, why some individuals go on to have problems. And we thought a similar paradigm existed within myocarditis, but there was no previous data on titan truncating variants in myocarditis patients. All there was was a single study performed in a paediatric population in 2017. So amongst these children, 16% were found to have rare variants linked with cardiomyopathy genes. And this was really the first study that sort of showed that perhaps previously uh, silent uh, genetic variation in the background may explain some of the presentations of these children with acute forms of heart failure. If we just step sideways for a moment, we also know that myocarditis overlaps with arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. So ARBC refers to the inherited abnormality of cardiac desmosomes characterized by fiber fatty replacement. It's an important cause of SCD, sudden cardiac death in the young. And as far back in 2009, we've known from various EP studies actually, where RV biopsies have been performed, guided by various bits of kit, that up to half of these patients actually have uh, features consistent with acute myocarditis on their endomyocardial biopsies. And so clearly there is an overlap and it's a case of whether what we're seeing is rather a hot phase of disease activity labelled as a potentially a myocarditis, um, which is actually part of the arrhythmogenic uh, disease itself. Um, there's a bit of a gap, but in recent years, what we've now started to appreciate in various case studies and case reports, which very much set the scene for our research study, which I'll talk about in a moment, was that there are various families that have myocarditis in various different family members, which is obviously slightly suspicious. And in many of these families, we find uh, enrichment of truncating variants in DSP, desmoplakin, being one of the uh, proteins within that cardiac desmosome. Also monozygotic twins, who both had myocarditis and both carried this underlying variant. And also there was a, a case series with 16 patients with myocarditis who were selected on the basis of having presentations with more arrhythmia or RV dysfunction. And more than half of those individuals carried arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy genes. And that led on to this nice paper that was published in early 2022, a retrospective study looking at 36 patients with acute myocarditis um, compared to patients. So patients with myocarditis and DSP truncating variants compared to myocarditis without any genetic abnormality. And it was shown quite nicely that having that genetic abnormality did portend a worse outcome. So with all of that background uh, available, we then set up our study, which was published in circulation towards the end of 2022. Uh, this was led by Professor Sanjay Prasad, James Ware, Stefan Haymans, and we had various other collaborators uh, involved as well. And this formed the basis of my PhD project. So I recruited 230 patients with acute myocarditis from across northwest London um, over a sort of two and a half year period. All of these patients had a CMR, which confirmed acute myocarditis as the entry point into the cohort. Uh, in parallel, our collaborators in Maastricht in the Netherlands recruited 106 patients 
uh, with acute myocarditis confirmed on an endomyocardial biopsy. And we also leveraged a previously recruited cohort of healthy controls, so over a thousand healthy controls with no evidence of myocarditis on a uh, CMR scan. We performed next generation DNA sequencing on all of these individuals and looked at the burden of rare protein altering variants in 11 DCM genes and five ARVC genes listed here. These are the genes which have the most robust uh, level of evidence linking the, the gene abnormality with the cardiomyopathy, so that's why we chose these. We focused on a population-based approach. What we didn't want to do was recruit the tip of an iceberg, so using data from NHS Digital, we were able to see that there were 2,353 admissions across the country due to acute myocarditis during the study period. Uh, most were men, median age of 40. And using that data, we were able to work out that what we recruited was actually 66% of all of the available hospital admissions in our patch of London during that study period. So hopefully what we were what we recruited was representative of what was being seen in the local hospitals rather than just what came into a tertiary centre or into a research study. We found that the median age of the patients was 33 for men, depicted by the blue bars here, and 46 for women. I think it's it's reasonably well known that there's this separation in age of presentation and there are lots of different hypotheses as to why that may be the case. In terms of patient demographics, our patients in London tended to be young men presenting with chest pain, ECG abnormalities, troponin elevation, and preserved LV function. In contrast, the patients in Maastricht, because they were mainly recruited after a myocardial biopsy confirming uh, CMR, they tended to be slightly older with uh, reduced LV function, a median of 36. So that was quite an important difference between the two cohorts. In terms of the results, what we found in London was that 4.8% of cases, these are myocarditis cases, or comers, had rare truncating variants in cardiomyopathy associated genes. So that's one in 20 patients. If we think about that for a minute, myocarditis hasn't really been traditionally considered as a genetic condition, but here we are finding one in 20 patients, unselected patients have underlying genetic variation linked with cardiomyopathy. Looking at the results in a little bit more detail, uh, in London, um, we found that the most prevalent gene abnormalities were found within arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy genes, specifically truncating variants occurring in 3% of our cohort. And that was a significant enrichment compared to healthy controls uh, with an odds ratio of 8.2. We also saw a little bit of uh, variation in the DCM genes, but not reaching significance. And again, the London cohort had predominantly preserved ejection fraction. In contrast, in Maastricht, we saw most of the variation in the DCM genes, 9.4%, uh, specifically within Titan, thereby confirming our original hypothesis. Um, so these patients had reduced LV function and they did have a significant enrichment of Titan truncating variants. We just look in a little bit more detail at the individual genes. So for DSP, um, which we found to be particularly prevalent in London, some of the scans for these patients are shown here. So uh, the images across the top are T2 stir sequences, um, showing cross sections through the myocardium. And you can see these regions of brightness here refer to the presence of myocardial edema or swelling within the heart muscle. Uh, and the bottom images show late enhancement, uh, which corresponds in the same area. So these are fairly typical uh, images for patients with acute myocarditis. Um, all of these patients were young men. They all presented with a similar pseudo-infarct type presentation with normal ejection fraction, both at baseline and at 12 months, with no other clear features of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy and no family history of anything concerning. So no other clues in the history. Um, so lots of work is now ongoing to try and understand what exactly is going on here, what is the mechanism behind this, um, and so that so hopefully will come soon. In Maastricht, we found that the truncating variants in Titan were the ones that were significantly enriched. You know, this is a key protein in the sarcomere, but we also confirmed the signal that we saw in the arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy genes as well. We did see in similar enrichment in, in their cases compared to controls. 
There are only two patients that had these such uh, variants, but these were both likely pathogenic and were not found in, in healthy control populations. So what we were able to do is um, put all of this data together in, in one figure. So each of the dots refers to an individual patient and you can see all of the different genes and the corresponding ejection fraction. The summary is shown at the bottom here. So patients that had uh, genetic variation in arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy genes tended to have preserved ejection fraction, whereas those with the DCM variants had reduced ejection fraction as one would expect. And that's across the combined cohort of 306 36 patients with confirmed myocarditis by CMR or myocardial biopsy. We also assigned pathogenicity. So often we can see uh, genetic changes and the sort of pathogenicity of that is sometimes unclear. So we put this through a well-established algorithm to confirm if what we were seeing was actually relevant or actionable or not. And we did confirm that in London, 4.3% of patients carried var variants that would be considered likely pathogenic uh, if found in a patient with cardiomyopathy. And likewise in Maastricht, the number remained high at 16%. So overall, the take home message was that one in 13 patients, so 8% carried likely pathogenic variants in these genes. We also delved into their clinical outcomes. Um, this wasn't our primary aim, but we had enough data to look at this as well. So over a median follow-up of five years, we were able to see that the risk of all-cause mortality was greater um, in the genotype positive patients shown here with the red line compared to the genotype negative patients, um, which was a significant finding. Uh, All-cause mortality was generally greatest in those with a DCM variant, so 18% compared to 4%. Uh, and major arrhythmia was also slightly increased in those with an arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy variant, but didn't quite reach significance. So coming to the end, this is the first uh, unselected population-based genetic study of acute myocarditis. And I think many of our findings will go some way to explaining why we see such a wide heterogeneity in clinical outcomes in myocarditis. We all know that most patients recover and do well, but there is a small but important subset who go on to have long-term problems. Now we can begin to understand why that may be. The study also provides some insight into sort of the gene environment interaction. We've already seen a lot of that in the world of sort of peripartum cardiomyopathy, alcohol and cardio-oncology, and now we're also seeing a similar paradigm uh, in acute myocarditis. I suppose the key question that arises from this work is, should we offer genetic testing to all patients uh, presenting with acute myocarditis? Now, bearing in mind, you know, we're seeing in excess of around one or 2,000 admissions per year, that, you know, that's a significant number. But a more sort of practical approach would be to focus on the patients who have a family history of cardiomyopathy or even a family history of myocarditis or recurrent myocarditis within the individual uh, if there is a, a high burden of arrhythmia. And of course, if patients present with LV dysfunction, which is persistent and doesn't recover uh, after sort of acute phase. Um, this, of course, has implications on clinical management, risk prediction, the need for ongoing surveillance. And one could imagine that there probably have been many patients over the decades with acute myocarditis who have been seen and discharged. And the opportunity to actually identify an underlying cardiomyopathy has been missed. So lots of potential questions have uh, arisen from this work. Of course, it took a, an army of people to make this happen. So thank you to everyone uh, who worked with me. Thank you for your attention and I welcome any questions. I mean, thank you very much. That was uh, that was excellent. Thanks for this uh, excellent presentation in a condition actually that has many faces, but perhaps the same pathophysiological pathways, to some extent at least. And we have many more to learn regarding the genetic background. Um, as you very nicely demonstrated, there is a breadth of uh, research on board. Please do stay with us for the questions, which will be at the end of the session.